God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, let's prepare our hearts for the word of God. Uh, there is just one other thing that I wanted to address before we go into the Word of God. I've been trying to listen to the powers that be for guidance. And as I was hearing the guidance proposed for churches, they said that worship places of worship have particular concerns. And they said one of them was singing. When people sing, they would tend to project. So I thought, well, a lot of y'all don't sing anyway. <laughs> and you all got your mask on. So I said, I, th I think we'll be all right with that one. But then they said that if you have a loud preacher <laughs> who really projects. And so when I, I said, well, this could be a problem. So because if I get going, I could take out the whole congregation. <laughs> so uh, what I, I'm going to do to the best of my ability is I, I'm not going to be putting it into third gear uh, in my preaching. So um, just so that you know, that, that is why I'm doing that. I'm saying that because I don't want you to think I got rusty over the past couple of months or I lost my anointing or something like that. But that's what we're going to be doing. Amen? Yeah. All right. Let's go to the Word of God. And I want to take our reading from Psalm 122 from the New Living Translation. And it's a chapter that I trust would have found new significance for us. I know it has for me. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are, standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people, make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord as the law requires of Israel. Here stand the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O oh, Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. My subject this morning, very simply, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. As I said, this verse has found new meaning, new significance to us at this time. This psalm, if you read in your Bible, you would note in many of the Bibles they have what is known as the label, a description of the psalm. And it says a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem, a psalm of David. Other versions, translations would call it a song of ascent. And 
What that means is this, along with about 15 other psalms, were known as psalms of ascent. These were songs that Israelites would sing as they made their way to Jerusalem, to the temple. Since Jerusalem was in a valley on a hill, no matter what direction you came from, you ascended to the temple. So hence the songs of ascent. And this was one of those. Three times a year, at least, the law commanded the Israelites from wherever they were, if at all possible, to make their way to Jerusalem and ascend to the temple for worship. And as they would approach Jerusalem and draw nearer to the temple, they would break out in one of these songs. It says it's a Psalm of David that is not without controversy because David did not have a temple to go into. If you remember, David wanted to build a temple and was forbidden and it was passed on to Solomon. So there was no temple for anyone to go into at that time. What they did was they worshiped in the tabernacle. This is what they worshiped in during the wilderness journey. And when they settled in the land of Canaan for many, many years, they remained worshiping in the tabernacle. So whether it was written by David regarding the temple or not, it was a song that referenced the house of the Lord. This psalm has a somewhat popular verse amongst evangelicals, which says, pray for peace in Jerusalem. And there are many evangelicals who have taken this verse as a proof text to say, this is all about loving Israel. This is why we should support the nation of Israel. And in fact, three times the word peace appears in this psalm. But this verse and this psalm has nothing to do with the nation of Israel. It was not about the Abrahamic covenant. Pray for peace in Jerusalem because verse 9 says, for the sake of the house of the Lord. Pray for Jerusalem because that's where the temple was. They wanted peace in Jerusalem because that's where the house of the Lord was. So this here is a psalm exalting the house of God. Stressing the importance and the value of having a place of worship. Now, as we have been in lockdown, I have heard and I have said a phrase that have been used all of my Christian life and certainly long before I got here. That says the church is not a building. We all know it. We've all said it. We all say it. The church has never been a building. But I have found that in times like we've been in, we can be challenged when a proverb becomes a cliche. When we say the church is not a building, what we mean by that, the church is about people. But there's billions of people in the world. It's more than just a crowd of people. When we say the church is not a building, it's about people. What we mean is it's our relationship with people. It's our relationship with one another. It's our willingness to engage in relationships with people that come into the church. 
That's what we mean when we say the church is not a building. And it has its scriptural roots in the book of Acts. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This was the environment that God chose to add to the church. This was the foundation of a church. But here's the thing. In this time that we've been in, for many people, it would seem that the church is a building. Because during this shutdown, there are people that never picked up the phone to call anybody. Never text anybody. Never bothered to see if they were well, if they were hungry, if they were dead. And if that's you, then maybe for you, the church was a building. Maybe for you, the church is a building. Because when the circumstance caused us to have our building taken away from us, what happened to those relationships? Now, I'm not talking about calling your friends who you call and talk to anyway, building or no building. I'm not talking about, well, I see them on Facebook, so I guess they're doing all right. I'm talking about, have you bothered to look in on anybody? Don't let that profound truth that the church is not a building become a cliche for the people of God. Now, we have been in tough times, unusual times, times that have proven to be confusing, depressing, as well as divisive. Now, when I find myself in circumstances, particularly stressful circumstances as we have been in, I like to think that I turn to the word of God and I ask our Lord, show me what I need to see in this. I certainly hear enough on the news. I hear enough from commentators. I certainly hear enough on Facebook. But Lord, what do you need me to see? What is your perspective on this? And what should my response be in this circumstance? And so I've been meditating on the word of God. And I believe that he has showed me some similarities from a story in the Bible. And it's the story of Noah and the flood. Now, I don't want to be misquoted here or misapplied. I am not saying that the COVID-19 crisis is identical to the days of the flood, doomsday, the end of the world. I'm not saying that. And I'm certainly not saying that the COVID-19 crisis is God's judgment on people, whether it's the church, the sinners, I am not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is that in the story of the flood, I see there are certain similarities, certain parallels that we can draw from and find some application so that we can get 
some spiritual, scriptural guidance on what we should be doing, how we should be regarding this. The story of Noah is a story about a man who saw the end of the world. His story is found in Genesis, the sixth chapter to the tenth chapter. Everyone knows the story. We've all learned it in Sunday school. We've seen the movies. In the story of the flood, in the story of Noah, I want to look at the before, the during, and the after. There are certain similarities that occurred before the flood that parallel our circumstance. There are similarities that occurred during the flood. And there are things that have happened after the flood. And there are things that we can get some parallels, some insights. Let's talk about before the flood. Now, right out the gate, I'm not the one who came up with this. We find it actually in the words of Jesus. Matthew 24, he says, As it was in the days of Noah so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus is actually making the comparison. For in the days of Noah before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Well, what does that mean? It may be somewhat surprising because you would expect something like Before the days of the flood, there were all kinds of sins. There was homosexuality. There was murder. There was chaos. Fornication. Abuse. Those aren't the things listed here. What's listed here is that before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying. In other words, going about their business. Well, what's wrong with that? The problem was, God is absent. That's what signified the days of Noah. God was not regarded in their everyday life. God was not a factor to anything that was going on in their world. What were the days before the flood? Noah lived in unprecedented times. A phrase that we've heard time and time again during this crisis. Hebrew says, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. So Noah was living in unprecedented times. Noah was living in a time when things that were happening never happened before. One of those things is the fact that it had never rained before. This was new. We read in Genesis, in the second chapter, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plants of the fields was in the earth, and before any herbs of the field had grown. For the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So it had never rained before. God had A system where the water, a mist came up from the ground. And that's how plants and trees got watered. So for Noah to say that it's going to rain, he's talking about something that never happened before. Unprecedented. What else was new? No one had ever seen an ark before. No one had ever built such a contraption before. An ark designed to take a massive amount of animals and a family in a flood that occurred from rain that never happened before. 
So as a result of these things, and the fact that no one was regarding the Lord in their lives, Noah had a message that nobody believed. Noah preached a message that nobody wanted to listen to. Unprecedented times. They had no regard for the Lord. And they saw no basis whatsoever in anything that Noah was selling. These were the days before the flood. What about during the flood? When the flood came, Noah saw everything that he knew gone. Any friends, distant family that he had, all died. His favorite grocery store and theater, no more. The things he enjoyed out of life are gone. So he is living in a time of grief where Noah has lost everything that he knew. Everything that he had grown accustomed to, that he had become used to, that was part of his life, is now gone never to be again. Noah was quarantined. And of course, it wasn't for the same reasons. It wasn't a medical issue at all. But he was in lockdown, unable to leave the ark, cooped up in one place. And we often think he was in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, no, actually not true at all. How long was Noah in the ark? When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted from the earth and the rain fell in the mighty torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. So it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And now the world is flooded and Noah is still in the ark. Chapter 8, Noah was now 601 years old. On the first day of the new year, ten and a half months after the flood began. The flood waters had almost dried up from the earth. Noah lifted back the covering of the boat and saw that the surface of the ground was drying. Drying, not dry. Two more months went by, and at last, the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, leave the boat, all of you, you and your wife, and your sons and their wives. So if you do the math, Noah is in the ark for over a year. We've been in lockdown for like two months and we're pulling our hair out. Can you imagine being locked down with smelly animals and your family <laughs> for over a year? Nowhere to go, stuck in lockdown. And what happened after the flood? Well, there are many things that happened after the flood, and I'm not about to make a lot of parallels as to what will happen for us, because I don't know. But what is clear, when they came out of the ark, things were different. There were changes there were things that they would start doing that they never did before. There were things that they used to do that they're not going to do anymore. Things have changed. They are in a new world. One of the things that have changed 
is their diet has changed. Genesis 9, it says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds of the sky, on every creature that moves along the sky, and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. So now their diet is changed. They are now allowed to eat meat. Before this, they were vegetarians. Adam and Eve were vegetarians. We read in Genesis, Then the Lord God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with the seed in it, they will be yours for food. So now the diet has changed. They can now eat meat and there are restrictions on that. They cannot eat meat strangled or from the blood. In other words, they can't eat raw bloody meat. It's interesting because when we come to the book of Acts, in the 15th chapter, there's contention in the church. There's an issue. What do we do with Gentile pagans who have never observed the law of Moses? And now they say they met Jesus Christ. Well, some in the church said they have to become Jews. They have to start living the life we live. They need to observe all of the laws of Moses. And Paul and others said, no, that's not the way this works. If they have been saved by grace, then they don't have to comply to the law of Moses. So we find this contention and the conclusion in Acts says when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon Peter has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from meat of the strangled animals, and from blood. Now, for some, they say, well, James, you're just compromising. You're picking out certain laws of Moses and say, well, they have to keep that. You're making exceptions. But that's really not what's happening. When you read it carefully, James is not pointing them back to Moses. James is pointing before Moses. He's pointing them back to Noah. James says they don't have to abide by the law of Moses, but we're going to rewind it back to the days of Noah, where they were not allowed to eat things strangled and with blood. Sometimes, in order to get something new, you have to let go of something normal. You have to let go of something that has been normal for you for a long time. And there are those who are going to struggle to come into a new world because they are in love with their normal. They're not going to want to change. They're not going to want to adjust. They're going to be married to their understanding of this is normal and I ain't doing otherwise. But sometimes 
you will lock yourself out from what God is trying to give you because you can't let go of the past. Like I said, I have, during this time, discovered verses that I knew that have, I have found new meaning in. That during this crisis, words of God that spoke to me in a way, in a more powerful way than I had ever heard before. I found new meaning in verses like, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? If it were to mean anything at any time, it should mean something now. And there are some of us who have learned this truth that no matter what goes on in the world, there is something that is constant. And that is our connection to Jesus Christ. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. None of that has the power or the ability to pull you away from Jesus Christ. Well, change is hard. And we like the way things were. We don't want things to be different. Consistency gives us an anchor. Certainty gives us an anchor. It gives us a sense of stability. What do we do when everything around us is changing? I found scriptures that have found new meaning in such times. I am the Lord and I do not change. So no matter what goes on in the world, no matter how things are different, I can hold on to something and someone who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't have to worry about him changing his mind. I don't have to worry about him going back on his word. And so while everything else is changing, it's on Christ the solid rock I stand. I'm trying to hold back, church. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We are living a time of Social distance, separation, where we can't hug people the way we want to. We can't even shake their hands the way we want to. But you can come near to God. You can still draw close to Jesus. There is no distance between you and the God we serve. And so we can have in this time, Lord, I might not be able to be close to my brothers and sisters. I might have to keep a certain distance. But I'm glad that I can reach out to you and know that you'll always be there. Know that there's no distance that can come between us where you would stop hearing me. That I couldn't come to you at any time in anywhere and have you put your arms around me and place your hands on my head and say, peace be still. I'm glad to be back in the house of God, but I'm glad to know that he never left me. He never forsook me. I'm glad to know that he will always be with me even till the end of time. Brick after brick, God is building Brick after brick, he's making it strong With Christ the sure foundation and his people are